I'm ready. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much uh, for coming this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure for us uh, to be hosting Judith Butler uh, tonight. Uh, I will I will read a few a few notes um, to introduce her talk to 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 describe a little bit the context of uh, of this uh, of this lecture and uh, and then we're going to be uh, ready for her. Um, uh, my name is Martin Plot. I'm a faculty member at the Aesthetics and Politics Program at CalArts, and uh, on behalf of the MA program, his director Anna de Buber and the rest of the faculty who are here. I want to thank uh, all those who contributed to having uh, Judith Butler as our theorist in residence this year, uh, and to many uh, of our other initiatives that they have contributed to. Uh, in particular, I would like to uh, thank uh, CalArts uh, president, Stephen Levine, and our uh, provost, uh, Janine Chabisky, uh, our dean uh, at the School of Critical Studies, uh, Amanda Beach. You don't see very well from here, so I'm trying to find you over there. The city of West Hollywood uh, mayor, and I really don't know where he is, uh, an aesthetics and politics alum, uh, both lifetime achievements, I would say. Uh, John D'Amico, uh, I know where you are, you? And, uh, uh, and the deputy mayor, um, the deputy to the mayor, uh, Michelle Rex. Uh, and of course, Red Cat's uh, director, Mark Murphy, and all the staff here who always go the extra mile to make our events uh, both uh, successful and, and enjoyable very much. Let me also use this opportunity uh, to announce that next academic year, our theorist in residence will be uh, our theorist uh, Thierry de Dieu, who will also uh, deliver a keynote talk in the context of our fall conference uh, this coming academic year. Uh, our fall um, 2015 conference will be held uh, um, and that in the keynote uh, talk here uh, as a questioning aesthetics uh, symposium, um, posing the question, when is art political? We are co-organizing this symposium with uh, Oxford Encyclopedia of Aesthetics editor Michael Kelly, uh, marking the release of the encyclopedia's second ex expanded edition this year. The MA uh, Aesthetics and Politics program, uh, which in the Calars School of Critical Studies we used to refer to as our new Aesthetics and Politics program, I must say is uh, no longer new. Several generations of students uh, have already graduated and are now increasingly influential voices in different fields of contemporary aesthetic and political theory, as well as in, the, in a multiplicity of aesthetic and political practices. Also for several years, we have had our West Hollywood Aesthetics and Politics lecture series uh, at the West Hollywood Public Library, a collaboration with the city of West Hollywood of which we are immensely proud of. And the large number of packed events, such as tonight, um, that we have shared here at Britcat is also one of our most cherished accomplishments. Together, both venues have provided us with the space and the stage we needed to fulfill one of our program's most important self-imposed mandates, that of contributing with new insights and reflections to the public debate, which means, in the words we often use in our program, that of intervening as often as possible in the complex and always dynamic intertwining of the visible and invisible and the thinkable and the unthinkable in our contemporary societies. The mutual enrichment provided by our everyday work and conversations among us as a faculty, with our great and always challenging students, and with by the by now too long to enumerate list of amazing speakers who have been generous enough to accept our invitations to come and share their thinking with us, this cannot be overestimated. Bringing together these two dimensions, the program's history and the generosity of our guests. I just want to simply close this part of the introduction, remembering a common friend uh, of Judith Butler uh, and I, uh, who gave the program's inaugural lecture in September of 2008 and who passed away uh, last year. Uh, the lecture was, was here. Uh, his name is Ernesto Laclau, uh, many of you know him. Uh, and let me uh, just say that we will certainly miss his critical contributions to the ways in which we organize and disrupt the given arrangements, always contingent, of course, of the intertwining of the visible and the invisible, and the thinkable and the unthinkable. But let me give you an example of what we mean by this, so you have a better idea of what we are up to. Just yesterday, in this same stage, some of you might have been here too, Stephen Levine hosted a conversation on Latin American 
and Latino voices in contemporary culture. The conversation itself was about why these voices, which are many and are here, are so little heard. The question is, of course, uh, an aesthetico-political one. Why is it that the contemporary distribution of the hearable and the unhearable, sorry about these neologisms, that's how we talk in the program. Uh, why this distribution of the hearable, I will say it again, and the unhearable <laughs> is so biased against Latino and Latin American voices, even in places uh, such as Los Angeles, to pronounce it in our language, in which those voices are so numerous. This is already significant, but I wanted to point out another dimension of yesterday's conversation. One of the panelists yesterday uh, was uh, Harry Gamboa Jr., who mentioned uh, that recently he was asked why he was no longer doing art on the walls of freeways or public buildings. To which his answer was simply that he was now 63 years old and that he would break his back uh, if he even attempted to do again what he used to do in his 20s. To which he added, significantly, that if he were to do that today, particularly as a concerted action, that is, with others, he would face the risk of facing life in prison for the crime of, of conspiracy. Early, early in the day, yesterday, I had already had a long conversation about public art, and in particular graffiti, with one of our MA students. And graffiti, graffiti is an art form that is at the center of more than one of our current students' interests. In that conversation, we were posing the following questions. What would an aesthetico political study of graffiti and the practice of graffiti entail? Shall we say that graffiti artists engage in performative or productive practices, and the latter meaning uh, having a goal of producing a final image. Shall we say instead that graffiti art is political because it happens in the public space? Again, in our program's words, in the space of appearance. But is the space of appearance a pre-existent space? Or is it instituted precisely by those practices that seek to transform a space of transit or a space conceived as private because of owned in a space for the appearance of critical and visual discourses otherwise excluded, marginalized, or barely heard and seen. The lack of graffiti in, you know, uh, in, I have two towns, LA and Buenos Aires, the lack of graffiti in LA is perplexing, you know, uh, compared to Buenos Aires. <clears throat> if the latter, that is, if this practice institutes the space for the appearance of critical and visual discourse, discourses otherwise excluded, marginalized, or barely heard and seen. If the latter, how is it that graffiti artists are not also political activists and even civil disobedience, since they are risking their freedom under, as Judith Butler would certainly remind us, vulnerable bodies at, at risk in a performative fashion, both violating and denouncing in the same act laws that shouldn't be on the books in the first place? In short, their challenging of the given distribution of the visible and invisible, and the readable and the unreadable, is it political or is it aesthetic? Well, as this brief example, I hope, seems to make clear, an aesthetic or political inquiry is not one that seeks to close or reduce to dichotomies, but rather to broaden our understanding of art and politics, and to dichotomy, and, and thus, sorry about, I missed the line, <laughs> and thus to pose questions that other approaches foreclose or render unthinkable. It is precisely in this field, in this place, that we call aesthetic political that we met Judith Butler, whose work on gender and war, on rights and bodies, on vulnerability and resistance, keeps reminding us that the already said is not the limit of the sayable, but rather the very silence that makes, it, that makes us speak. Please. Join me in welcoming Judith Butler for the third of her four lectures at the Calars Aesthetics and Politics Program. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm enormously pleased to be here. Uh, I want to uh, thank Cal Arts and Red Cat uh, Mart Martin Plot uh, for his generous introduction. Um, 
indeed, uh, both Martine and Arne de Bouva have been wonderful colleagues during this time I have spent at, at Cal Arts. Um, this talk, like my um, previous ones, uh, takes as its point of departure demonstrations. What does it mean to demonstrate? What happens when we demonstrate? What are those public gatherings um, born of outrage or indignation uh, marking that something unacceptable or indeed unendurable is going on? Indeed, when one goes to a public demonstration, uh, one thinks uh, about why one is there, with whom one is uh, demonstrating and what it is one hopes to achieve. Um, at the same time, however, one knows either in a somewhat uh, pre-conscious way or in a very heightened and alert way um, that the police are already there um, <laughs> or that they're coming um, or that it's always possible that the police uh, whose function it is to protect the right to gather, the right of assembly, may well disperse the gathering or arrest or even injure those who are there. We surely know that those who gather on the street or in public domains where police are present are always at risk of detention and arrest, but also forcible handling and injury, even death. So at a perceptual level, it's already clear that those who gather to resist various forms of state and economic power are taking a risk with their own bodies, exposing themselves to possible harm. But should this sequence frame our understanding of the relationship between vulnerability on the one hand and resistance on the other? First, you resist and then you're confronted with your vulnerability either in relation to police power or those who show up to oppose your political stance. Maybe, maybe it doesn't work quite that way. I want to suggest that vulnerability emerges earlier prior to any gathering and that this is especially true when people demonstrate to oppose the precarious conditions in which they live. That condition of precarity indexes a uh, vulnerability that precedes the one that people encounter quite graphically, quite uh, bodily on the street. If we also say that the vulnerability to dispossession, poverty, insecurity, and harm that constitutes a precarious position in the world leads to resistance, then it seems we reverse the sequence. First we are vulnerable and then we over come that vulnerability, at least provisionally, through agentic acts of resistance. Of course, it will be important to establish a more precise relationship between vulnerability and precarity, but let us consider, as a clear example, modes of resistance that emerge in opposition to failing infrastructure. The dependency on infrastructure for a livable life seems clear but when infrastructure fails, and fails consistently, how do we understand that condition of life? We have found that that on which we are dependent is in fact not there for us, which means that we are left without support, without shelter, for instance. We are vulnerable to weather, to cold heat disease, perhaps also to assault from strangers or the police, hunger and violence. It was not as if we were, as creatures, not vulnerable before, but when infrastructure fails, that vulnerability comes to the fore. When movements against homelessness emerge, the unacceptable character of that vulnerability, in the sense of exposure to harm, is made clear, but a question still remains. Does vulnerability remain an important part of any mode of resistance to that condition? Does resistance require overcoming vulnerability, or could we say that resistance involves mobilizing vulnerability? Consider that a movement may be galvanized for the very purpose of establishing adequate infrastructure or keeping adequate infrastructure from being destroyed. We can think about mobilizations in the shanty towns or townships of South Africa, Kenya, Pakistan, the temporary shelters constructed along the borders of Europe, <clears throat> 
but also the barrios of Venezuela, the favelas of Brazil, or the barracas of Portugal. Such spaces are populated by groups of people, immigrants, squatters, and or Roma, who are struggling precisely for running in clean water, working toilets, sometimes a closed door on public toilets, paved streets, paid work, and necessary provisions. So the street is not always the site that we can take for granted as the public ground for certain kinds of public gatherings, certain kinds of demonstrations. The street as public space and thoroughfare is also a public good for which people fight, an infrastructural necessity that forms one of the demands of popular mobilization. The street is not just the basis or platform for a political demand, but an infrastructural good. So when assemblies gather in public spaces in order to fight against the decimation of infra infrastructural goods, to fight against austerity measures, for instance, that would undercut public education, libraries, transit systems, and roads, we find that the very platform for which a politics um, that, that is supposed to enable such a politics is one of the items on the political agenda. Sometimes a mobilization happens precisely in order to create or keep the platform for political expression itself. The material conditions for speech and assembly are part of what we are speaking and assembling about. We have to assume the infrastructural goods for which we are fighting, but if the infrastructural conditions for politics are themselves decimated, so too are the assemblies that depend upon them. At such a point, the condition of the political is one of the goods for which political assembly forms. This might be the double meaning of the infrastructural under conditions in which public goods are increasingly dismantled by privatization, neoliberalism, accelerating forms of economic inequality, and anti-democratic tactics of authoritarian or securitarian rule. I begin then, as I've begun before in some of these lectures, by calling attention to the infrastructural conditions of mobilization, as well as the aim of preserving infrastructural goods, not because I will give an account of the infrastructural, maybe one day. I do this only because I wish to point out that even as public resistance, gathering the street, can lead to vulnerability, vulnerability to the police, vulnerability to the opposition, and vulnerability, the sense of exposure, we might say, implied by precarity, leads to resistance. Vulnerability is not exactly overcome by resistance. It becomes a potentially effective mobilizing force in political mobilizations. The point of a political mobilization is not to become invulnerable, as if that were uh, the ultimate value. In effect, the demand for infrastructure is a demand for a certain kind of inhabitable ground, and its meaning and force derives precisely from that lack. So the street cannot be taken for granted as the space of appearance, the space of politics, as Hannah Arendt has claimed, since there is, as we know, a struggle to establish that very ground. But Arendt is at least partially right when she claims that the space of appearance comes into being at the moment of political action. In a way, it's a romantic notion of an embodied performative speech act, since in any time or place that we act, the space of appearance for the political may come into being. Of course, that's not always true. We can try to act collectively, and no space of appearance is established. And that usually has to do with the absence of media or particular ways that the public sphere is structured to keep such actions from appearing, zoning, permits, rules against congregating. Arendt clearly presumes that the material conditions for gathering are separate from any particular space of appearance that we can collectively generate. But if politics is oriented toward the making and preserving of the conditions of assembly, the conditions of politics, even the sphere of appearance as an open sphere in which politics can emerge, then it seems that the space of appearance is not ever fully separable from questions of infrastructure and questions of architecture. What implication does this 
notion of supported political action have for thinking about vulnerability and resistance. I'm suggesting that all of us depend on the platforms uh, from which, on which we speak and act, and that we're not exactly separable from those platforms. We could say, oh, there's the platform, and here's my action based on the platform, but actually the platform is already part of my action. It's not just its external condition of possibility. So we have to have an idea of a supported political action. Um, and my question is, what does this concept of supported political action imply for thinking about vulnerability and resistance? Those are the two concepts that form the focus of my remarks tonight. My task is to suggest perhaps a slightly different way of understanding that interrelationship than the ones mm, that we usually talk about. In a sense, we already know that the idea of freedom can only be exercised if there's enough support for the exercise of freedom. If, there's a, if there are a set of conditions that, we, that enter into the act that it makes possible. Indeed, when we think about embodied subjects who exercise speech or move through public space across borders even, it's usually presumed to be one who is or those who are already free to speak and move. Either that subject is endowed with that freedom as an inherent power, or that subject is presumed to live in a public space where open and supported movement is possible. The very term mobilization depends on an operative sense of mobility, itself a right, one which many people cannot take for granted. For the body to move, it must usually have a surface of some kind, and it must have at its disposal whatever technical supports allow for movement to take place. So the pavement and the street are already to be understood as requirements of the body as it exercises its rights of mobility. No one moves without a supportive environment and a set of technologies. Disability studies and disability activism have made this clear. And when environments start to fall apart or technologies are no longer available or are emphatically unsupportive, we are left to fall in some ways in our very capacity to exercise those basic rights, rights of movement, rights of assembly are imperiled. We could certainly make a list of how this idea of a body both supported and agentic, is at work implicitly or explicitly in any number of political movements, struggles for food and shelter, protection from injury on the workplace and destruction in war, the right to work, affordable health care, protection from police violence and imprisonment, illness, mobilizations against austerity and precarity, authoritarianism and inequality. So on one level, we're asking about the implicit idea of the body at work in certain kinds of political demands and mobilizations. On another level, we're trying to find out how mobilizations presuppose a body that requires support, but in requiring support, also acquires its agency. In many of the public assemblies that draw people who understand themselves to be in precarious positions, the demand to end precarity is enacted publicly by those who expose their vulnerability to failing infrastructural conditions. There is a plural and performative bodily resistance at work that shows how bodies are being acted on by social and economic policies that are decimating livelihoods. But these bodies, in showing indeed in demonstrating their precarity are also resisting those very powers. They enact a form of resistance that presupposes and even demonstrates vulnerability of a specific kind. What's the conception of the body here? How do we understand this form of resistance? Well, if we make the matter individual, we can say that every single body has a certain right to food and shelter. Although we universalize in such a statement, every body has this right, we also particularize understanding the body as discrete, as an individual matter, and that individual body is significantly shaped by a norm of what the body is and how it ought to be. Of course, that seems quite obviously right, but consider that this idea of the individual bodily subject 
subject of rights, might fail to capture the sense of vulnerability, exposure, even dependency that is implied by the right itself and which corresponds, I would suggest, with an alternative view of the body. In other words, if we accept that part of what a body is, and this is for the moment an ontological claim in case you want to write that down, if we accept that part of what a body is, like, oh, Butler's making an ontological claim, okay? <laughs> Um, part of what a body is is its dependency on other bodies and networks of support, then we're suggesting that it's not altogether right to conceive of individual bodies as completely distinct from one another or the conditions of their possibility. Neither are they blended into some amorphous social body, but if we cannot readily conceptualize the political meaning of the human body without understanding those relations which let it live and thrive, we fail to make the best possible case for the various political ends we seek to achieve. What I'm suggesting is that it's not just that this or that body is bound up in a network of relations, but that the body, despite its clear boundaries or perhaps precisely by virtue of those boundaries, is defined by the relations that make its own life and action possible. As I'll hope to show, we cannot understand bodily vulnerability outside of the relations by which it is constituted. One clear dimension of our vulnerability has to do with our exposure to name calling and discursive categories in infancy and childhood that last, as it were, in one form or another throughout life. All of us are called names. I think some of my pals from high school are here. I don't know if you remember being called names, but I do. Um, all of us are called names, and this kind of name calling demonstrates an important dimension of the speech act. We do not only act through the speech act, speech acts also act upon us. So there's a distinct performative effect of having been named as this gender or another gender as part of one nationality or a minority or to find out that how you are regarded in any of these respects is summed up by a name that you yourself did not know. We can and do ask, am I that name? How do we think about the force and effect of those names we are called before emerging into language as speaking beings prior to any capacity for a speech act of our own? Does speech act upon us prior to our speaking? And if it did not act upon us, could we speak at all? And perhaps it's not simply a matter of sequence. Does speech continue to act upon us at the very moment in which we speak so that we may well think we are acting, but we're also acted upon at that very same time? Several years ago, Eve Sedgwick and I had an interesting discussion about performance and performativity. Sedgwick found that speech acts deviate from their aims, very often producing consequences that were altogether unintended and oftentimes quite felicitous. For instance, one could, in her view, take a marriage vow, and this act could then establish a, pub a public recognition of one's marriage, which then allows or opens up a zone of possible sexuality that takes place quite under the radar, taking advantage precisely of its non-recognizability. Right? Oh, I'm married. In this sense, marriage organizes sexuality, perhaps as we might expect, conjugal and monogamous forms, but it also produces another zone of sexuality defined precisely by its lack of overt recognition in the public sphere. Sedgwick underscored the sense of how a speech act could veer away from its apparent aims, and this deviation was one sense of the word queer understood less as an identity than as a movement of thought and language contrary to accepted forms of authority and normativity, always deviating and so opening up spaces for desire that would not always be openly recognized within established norms. In my earlier work, as I suggested in my first lecture, I was interested in how several discourses on gender seem to create and circulate certain ideals of gender generating those ideals, but taking them to be natural essences or internal truths that were subsequently expressed in those ideals. So the effect of a discourse, in this case a set of gender ideals, was broadly misconstrued as the internal cause of one's desire and behavior, a core reality that was expressed in one's gestures and actions. So one could say, 
mm, I have this internal, uh, this internal femininity, I have this internal masculinity, and it's slowly and surely expressed by my acts and gestures. But the question is, of course, first of all, how did it get to be internal? Was it always internal? Was it internalized? Uh, but secondly, could it be that we sometimes see in our acts and gestures an apparent masculinity or femininity that we then, in some sense, uh, understand to, um, to express this internal truth when actually it's, 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 it's produced retroactively through the gesture and the action. That internal cause or core reality not only substituted for the social norm, but effectively masked and facilitated the operation of that norm. The formulation that gender is performative became the basis for some long discussions on topics including two quite contrary interpretations. The first is that we radically choose our genders, Butler says. The second was <laughs> that we are utterly determined by gender norms, but Butler says. Those wildly divergent responses, responses meant that I didn't write a very good book, but um, perhaps, um, um, perhaps actually they, what they do, at least for me now, is articulate something about the dual dimension of any account of gender performativity. For if language acts upon us before we act and continues acting in every instant in which we act, then we have to think about gender performativity performativity first as gender assignment, all those ways in which we are, as it were, called a name and gendered prior to understanding anything about how gender norms act upon us and shape us, prior to our capacity to reproduce those norms in ways that we might choose. Choice comes late in the process of performativity. Secondly, following Sedgwick, we have to understand how deviations from those norms can and do take place, suggesting that something queer is at work at the heart of gender performativity, a queerness that's not so very different from the swerves taken by the concept of iterability in Derrida's account of the speech act. So let's assume then that performativity describes both the processes of being acted on and the conditions and possibilities for acting and that we can't understand its operation without both of these dimensions. Norms act upon us, okay, that implies we are susceptible to their action, vulnerable to a certain name calling from the start. Indeed, the infant, right, who's addressed like, oh, he's such a beautiful girl, look at the beautiful girl. <laughs> oh my God, Lois, how did you get such a beautiful girl? <laughs> Where are you guys? Okay. Um, <laughs> right, I mean, that's noise, that's noise coming at the end. The infant's like, hmm, right? The infant's like, what, you know, English, no, you know, what, language, address, right? That's, that's overwhelming noise, right? So let's think about gender assignment as happening to us precisely at that moment of intense vulnerability where language comes at us, we're responsive, we're affected, right? We don't know what exactly is being said, but all we know is that one of the very primary moments of responsiveness and vulnerability we have is in relationship to that address. Oh, it's a girl. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so this registers at a level that is prior to any possibility of choice, or maybe those are like the little moments of choice, who knows, but it's hard to understand that as volitional in any way. An understanding of gender assignment has to take up this field of unwilled receptivity, of primary susceptibility and vulnerability, a way of being exposed to language and power prior to any possibility of forming or enacting a self-designation, a, a speech act by which I name or situate myself in the world. Norms such as these both require and institute certain forms of corporeal vulnerability without which their operation would not be thinkable. 
That is why we can and do describe the powerful citational force of gender norms as they are instituted and applied by medical, legal, and psychiatric institutions. And we object, often, some of us do, to the effect they have on the formation and understanding of gender in pathological or criminal terms. And yet this very domain of susceptibility, this condition of being affected, is also where something queer can happen, where the norm is refused or revised or given its own spin, where new formulations of gender begin. Although gender norms precede us and act upon us, that is one sense of its enactment, we are obligated to reproduce them, and that is the second sense of its enactment. Precisely because something inadvertent, unexpected, queer can happen in this realm of being affected, we find forms of gender that break with mechanical patterns of repetition, deviating from, resignifying, and sometimes quite emphatically breaking those citational chains of gender normativity, making room for new forms of gendered life. The theory of gender performativity, as I understood it, never prescribed which gender performances were right or more subversive, which were wrong and reactionary. Not at all. The point was precisely to relax the coercive hold of norms on gendered life, which is not the same as transcending all norms for the purposes of living a more livable life. Now, it may seem odd that I'm talking about gender performativity when I mean to be talking about vulnerability and resistance, but I think you can see that vulnerability and resistance are already here at this particular nexus of relationship. To under understand that the names we are called are just important to performativity as the names we call ourselves, we have to identify the conventions that operate in a broad array of gender assigning strategies. Then we can see how the speech act, um, how speech acts affect and animate us in embodied ways. Indeed, indeed, the field of susceptibility and affect is already a matter of registering at a bodily level what it is one is being called or how one is being treated, how one is being addressed. So though gender performativity for some seemed to be a theory that relied on a ceaselessly active subject who's constantly making itself and constituting itself in relative freedom, um, uh, in fact, um, that subject is already and from the start affected by and constituted by social powers that are beyond its control and prior to its volition. Seems important to distinguish here between um, two different actions of the norm. And I want you to have patience with this before I return to the broader problem of vulnerability and resistance. In the, in the first case, the norm, gender norm, racial norm, is interpolated, and it could be understood most easily in this context as the interpolating action of gender assignment. We are treated, hailed, addressed, formed by social norms that precede us, and they themselves form the constraining context for whatever forms of agency we ourselves take on in time. We never quite overcome our formations, but we do veer from, the apparent, from their apparent aims at times, and that means that finding a queer way and becoming an agent are somehow linked. But there's a second sense of norms that I'd like to underscore. Um, and uh, those are not precisely counter to our own sense of agency. They constitute the intersubjective and infrastructural conditions of a livable life. We don't seek to overcome those social and material conditions of our lives. We seek to make them more just, more equal, and more enabling. In other words, they are normative. We want them. We are in favor of them. <laughs> the, the, the norm that, that life should be livable for everyone, great ideal, that norm is not one that we refuse as normalizing and policing. That is one I think we embrace and seek to uh, realize in more and more concrete ways. So whatever performative agency might mean, it cannot overcome these prior and constituting dimensions of social normativity. There's some dimension of social normativity we all require in the same way that we require infrastructural conditions for our agency. 
It's here that I would identify both dependency and vulnerability as part of the performative account of agency. Indeed, the embodiment presupposed by both gender and performance is one that is dependent on institutional structures and broader social worlds, sustaining social worlds. We cannot talk about a body without knowing what supports that body and what its, relation, what it, its relationship is to that support or lack of support. In this way, the body is less an entity than a relation or indeed a web of relations, and it cannot be fully dissociated from the infrastructural and environmental conditions of its living and thriving. The dependency on human and other creatures on infrastructural support exposes a specific vulnerability that we have when we are unsupported, when those conditions characterizing our social, political, and economic lives start to decompose or fall apart when we find ourselves radically unsupported under conditions of precarity. Precarity is, in effect, the condition of being radically unsupported or successively or in an accelerated way facing the lack of support. <clears throat> okay, how does this then take us back to demonstrations? Well, first of all, all public assembly is, I want to suggest, haunted by the police and the prison and every public square is defined in part by the population that could not possibly arrive there. Either they're detained at the border or they have no freedom of movement or assembly or they're imprisoned. In other words, the freedom to gather as a people is always haunted by the imprisonment of those who exercise that freedom and were taken to prison. And when one arrives in public or common spaces with radical and critical views, there's always an anxious or even certain anticipation that imprisonment may well follow. Sometimes we walk or run knowingly in the direction of prison because it's the only way to expose illegitimate constraints on public assembly and political expression. In Geze Park two years ago in, in, in Turkey, some who were assembled were, were detained and others were hurt. The lawyers who came to help those who were detained were themselves detained. And sometimes the medical workers who came to help the injured were themselves subject to injury and detention. A new group would arrive, activists, journalists, health professionals, lawyers. They would replenish the network of support. In the case of Pussy Riot, demonstrations broke out in major cities all across the globe, and internet forms of solidarity emerged to put pressure on governments and human rights agencies to press for the release of those imprisoned and to object to the conditions of political imprisonment. Both of these examples compel us to turn attention to political imprisonment and to the institution of the prison industry as a global mechanism for the regulation of rights of citizenship. As you probably know, in the US, two thirds of prisoners are black men. Nearly every person on death row is a person of color. Angela Davis has argued that the prison in the US continues the work of slavery. Why? Because it suspends the very rights of citizenship for people of color. It becomes slavery, she would say by other means. I want to suggest that feminism is, cru is a crucial part of these networks of solidarity and resistance precisely because feminist critique destabilizes those institutions that depend on the reproduction of inequality and injustice. It criticizes those institutions and practices that inflict violence on women and gender minorities, and in fact all minorities subject to police power for showing up and speaking out as they do. Um, as you may or may not know, we're witnessing mass movements against the notion of gender in France. There are people who are pour le genre and there are people who are contre le genre. Um, in several Eastern European countries, in Poland in particular, and these are allied with movements against reproductive freedom, gay marriage, against lifting constraints imposed upon women's literacy, employment, and expressive freedoms. Time and again, we hear from government authorities in several parts of the world that what women and minority populations consider to be basics of equality and freedom go against the common norms of a national culture, or that their goals are unrealistic or ungrateful, or that what they call equality and freedom are actually dangerous, posing grave security risks to the nation or to Europe or indeed to civilization itself. The Russian government accused Pussy Riot as of, of attacking the soul of man. That was kind of a big deal. 
few, few struggles are more important than those that call into question so-called common norms by asking whose lives were never included in those norms, whose lives are in fact explicitly excluded from those norms. What norm of the human constrains those common norms and to what extent is it masculinist? To what extent is it a norm of racial privilege? I've suggested that we rethink the relationship between the human body and infrastructure so that we might call into question the body as a discrete, singular, and self-sufficient kind of being. And I've proposed instead to understand embodiment as both performative and relational. Relationality includes dependencies on infrastructural conditions and legacies of discourse and institutional power that precede and condition our existence. I'm also suggesting that certain ideals of independence are masculinist and that a feminist account exposes the disavowed dependency at the heart of the masculinist idea of the body. This is different from saying what women's bodies are or what men's bodies are. I don't really know. I'm not making those claims, but only showing what I take to be a masculinist conception of bodily action that should be actively criticized. My reference to dependency may well include dependency on the mother or the primary caretaker for a child, but that's not the form of primary dependency that concerns me here, at least it's not the only one. By theorizing the human body as a certain kind of dependency on infrastructure, understood complexly as environment, social relations, networks of support and sustenance, um, by which the human proves not to be fully divisible from the animal or the technical world, we foreground the ways in which we are vulnerable to decimated or disappearing infrastructures, economic supports, and predictable and well-compensated labor. We are then not only vulnerable to one another, an invariable feature of social relations, but this very vulnerability indicates a broader condition of dependency and interdependency, which challenges the dominant ontological understanding of the embodied subject. Of course, there are many reasons not to like vulnerability. Most of us wish we were less vulnerable under conditions in which we are impinged upon in ways we do not choose. Vulnerability names this very condition. But that alone is no reason to reject a theoretical consideration of its uses, especially when it turns out that vulnerability cannot rightly be reduced to what we cannot willingly want. In the final set of my remarks, I want to argue against the notion that vulnerability is the opposite of resistance. Indeed, I want to argue affirmatively that vulnerability, understood as occasionally a deliberate exposure to power, is part of the very meaning of political resistance as an embodied enactment. I know that speaking about vulnerability produces resistance of various kinds for the reasons I've just mentioned. There are those who worry that vulnerability, even if it becomes a theme or a problem for thinking, will be asserted as the new primary existential condition, and that this sort of foundationalism will founder on the same rocky shores as have others, such as the ethics of care or maternal thinking. Or some people worry that if feminism in any way becomes associated with vulnerability, no matter which version, it will become captured by the term and women will end up being portrayed in ways that rob them of their agency. Why are they always the vulnerable ones? Does a turn to vulnerability seek to reintroduce those foundationalist or essentialist modalities of thinking and valuing back into public discourse? Is it smuggling in discounted paradigms for reconsideration? The resistance to vulnerability is sometimes, of course, based on explicitly political grounds. After all, if women or minorities seek to establish themselves as vulnerable, vulnerable populations, do they unwittingly or wittingly seek to establish a protected su subject status, um, one that requires a paternalistic set of powers that will protect them? Um, and does that inadvertently constitute them as weak and in need of protection? Isn't that the oldest role in the book for women? Does the discourse of vulnerability discount the political agency of the subjugated? Well, one per political problem that emerges from any such discussion is whether the discourse on vulnerability shores up paternalistic power, relegating the condition of vulnerability to those who suffer discrimination, exploitation, or violence. What about the power of those who are oppressed, 
What about the vulnerability of paternalistic institutions themselves? They can be dismantled, they can fall apart. After all, if they can be contested, brought down, or rebuilt, then paternalism is vulnerable to a critique that would undo it as a form of power. And when this dismantling is undertaken by subjugated peoples, do they not establish themselves as something other than, or more than, vulnerable? Indeed, do we want to say that they become their vulnerability at such moments, which is to assume that vulnerability is negated when it converts into agency? Or is vulnerability still there, just now assuming a different form? Of course, there are justified political objections to the fact that dominant groups can use the discourse of vulnerability to shore up their privilege. Remember in California when white people were losing their status as a majority and some of them claimed that they were now a vulnerable population? That was really great. <laughs> Colonial states have lamented their vulnerability to attack by those they colonize and sought general sympathy on the basis of that claim. Some men have complained that feminism has made them into a vulnerable population and that they're now targeted for discrimination. Various European national identities now claim to be under attack by new and established migrant communities. We can see that the term has a way of shifting. And since we may not like some of those shifts, or many of them, we may find ourselves somewhat awkwardly opposed to vulnerability. Seems like an odd thing to be. Of course, that's a funny thing to say since we might conjecture that any amount of opposition to vulnerability does not exactly defeat its operation in our bodily and social lives. Indeed, vehement opposition to vulnerability may prove to be the very sign of its continuing operation. That seems to be a minimal truth that we can accept from psychoanalysis without necessarily having a big discussion about whether we accept everything else. <laughs> and yet, do our political objections to vulnerability make us into psychoanalytic fools? And do our psychoanalytic affirmations of vulnerability make us complicit with political positions we do not condone? When we oppose vulnerability as a political term, it's usually because we would like to see ourselves as agents. We, would, we think that better political consequences will follow if we see ourselves as capable of action. If we oppose vulnerability in the name of agency, does that imply that we prefer to see ourselves as those who are only acting but never acted upon? How might we then describe those regions of both aesthetics and ethics that presume that our receptivity is bound up with our responsiveness and that this is a zone in which we are always acted upon by objects, by the world, by what is said, by what is shown, by what we hear, and by what touches us? Now, if we take this basic domain of impressionability away, that would be, I think, the nullification of aesthetics as field and practice and thought. Um, then we can ask what aspects of the world, um, if, if we accept it as primary, if we accept this domain of impressionability as primary, then we can ask what aspects of the world impress themselves upon us at the very moment in which we form an impression of that world. What we find is at the same time that we act, uh, we are acted upon. So does the opposition to vulnerability also imperil a host of related terms like responsiveness, impressionability, susceptibility, the capacity to be moved, injured, openness, indignation, outrage, and even resistance? If nothing acts on me against my will or without my advanced knowledge, then there's only my sovereignty, the posture of pure control over the property that I have and that I am, a seemingly sturdy and self-centered form of the thinking I that seeks to cloak those fault lines in the self that cannot be overcome. What form of politics is supported by such an adamant mode of disavowal, such a rigid form of sovereignty? Is this not the masculinist account of the embodied subject that we're hoping to dismantle. As I've tried to suggest by calling attention to the dual dimension of performativity, we're invariably acted upon and acting, and this is one reason why performativity cannot be re reduced to the idea of free individual performance. We're called names, we find ourselves living in a world of categories and descriptions way before we start to sort them out critically and endeavor to change or make them on our own. 
In this way, we are quite, in spite of ourselves, vulnerable to and affected by discourses that we never chose. I think that's what it means to live in language in history. In a parallel way, I want to suggest that there's a dual relationship to resistance that helps us understand what we mean by vulnerability. There's a resistance to vulnerability that takes both psychic and political dimensions. The psychic resistance to vulnerability wishes that it were never the case that discourse and power were imposed upon us in ways that we never chose, and so seeks to shore up, shore up a notion of individual sovereignty against the shaping forces of history on our embodied lives. On the other hand, the very meaning of vulnerability changes when it becomes understood as part of the practice of resistance, of political resistance in particular. Indeed, one of the important features of public assembly that we recently have seen confirms that political resistance relies fundamentally on the mobilization of vulnerability, which means that vulnerability can be a way of being exposed and agentic at the same time. Such collective forms of resistance are structured very differently than the idea of a political subject who establishes its agency by vanquishing its vulnerability. A most important criticism emerges from those who argue that vulnerability should not be the basis for group identification, that it strengthens paternalistic power, as I mentioned. Once groups are marked as vulnerable, and this happens quite often within human rights discourses, those groups become reified as definitionally vulnerable, fixed in a political position of powerlessness and lack of agency. All the power belongs to the state or to international institutions that are now supposed to offer them protection and advocacy. But such moves tend to underestimate or indeed actively efface modes of political agency and resistance that emerge within so-called vulnerable populations that are undertaken by them. To understand those extra ju juridical modes of resistance, we would have to think about how resistance and vulnerability work together, something that the paternalistic model cannot do. So if we accept that they do or can work together, that implies a critique of paternalism. In my view, as much as vulnerability can be affirmed as an existential condition, for sure, we're all subject to accidents, illness, attacks that can expunge our lives quite quickly or brutally. It's also a socially induced condition which accounts for why it is that certain populations are exposed disproportionately to suffering or to, indeed to mortality rates, especially um, uh, those we now call the precariat for whom access to shelter, food, and medical care is quite often drastically limited. It would not be a sufficient politics to embrace vulnerability or to get in touch with our feelings or to bear our fault lines as if that might launch a new mode of authenticity or inaugurate a new mode of moral values or a sudden and widespread outbreak of care. <laughs> I'm not in favor of such moves toward authenticity as a way of doing politics. It continues to locate vulnerability as the opposite of agency and to identify agency with sovereign modes of defensiveness, and to fail to recognize the ways in which vulnerability can be an incipient and enduring moment of resistance. Once we understand the way vulnerability enters agency, then our understanding of both terms can change, and the binary opposition between them can become undone. I consider the undoing of this binary a feminist task, but also a queer one. To summarize, vulnerability is not a subjective disposition. I mean, you can say, oh, I'm feeling vulnerable today. I don't think I can go out. But that's not, and we do say that, and it is sometimes true. I think we actually are saying something else, which is I cannot be exposed to what is unexpected or to that over which I do not have control in advance. So better not get on the bus. Um, in other words, vulnerability is, all, is always a relation to a field of objects, forces, passions that impinge upon us or inf affect us in some way. It's not just what I happen to be feeling as a kind of quirk. As a way of being related to what is not me and what is not fully masterable, vulnerability is a kind of relationship that belongs to that ambiguous region in which receptivity and responsiveness are not clearly separable from one another, not distinguished as separate moments in a sequence. Indeed, where receptivity and responsiveness become the basis for mobilizing vulnerability, 
rather than engaging in its destructive denial. Of course, I'm aware that I've used resistance in at least two ways, and I'm grateful to Jacqueline Rose for um, giving us this important distinction. First, as the resistance to vulnerability that characterizes that form of thinking that models itself on mastery. Second, as a social and political form, um, and so not one of its opposites. I've suggested that vulnerability is neither fully passive nor fully active, but operating in a middle region, a constituent feature of the human animal as being both affected and affecting acted upon and acting. I am thus led to think about those practices of deliberate exposure to police or military violence in which bodies put on the line either receive blows or seek to stop violence by becoming living blockades or barriers. In such practices of nonviolent resistance, we can come to understand bodily vulnerability that's, that is something that's marshaled or mobilized for the purposes of blocking a violent act. Of course, such a claim is controversial. Those practices can seem allied with self-destruction. But what interests me are those forms of nonviolent resistance that mobilize vulnerability for the purposes of asserting existence, saying we are here, claiming the right to public space, equality, opposing violent police, security, and military actions. We may think that these are isolated moments in which a group decides in advance to produce a blockade or to link arms in order to lay claim to public space or to resist being removed by the police. And that is surely true, as it was in Berkeley in 2011 when a group of students and colleagues were assaulted by police forces on campus at the very moment they were practicing nonviolent protest. And that was quite a moment. A faculty member comes forward following established protocols, Martin Luther King, Gandhi offers, offers her wrists to be handcuffed and she is pulled by the hair onto the ground and beaten. That is a sign that the contemporary militarization of the police means that police are no longer honoring uh, historically recognized protocols of nonviolent resistance, so keep that in mind. But consider as well that for transgendered people in many places in the world and women who seek to walk the street at night in safety, the moment of actively appearing on the street involves a deliberate risk of exposure to force, but it's also the mobilization of a basic right to mobility. Under certain conditions, continuing to exist, even moving, walking the street, breathing, are forms of resistance, which is why we sometimes see placards in Palestine with the slogan, we still exist, exclamation point. As we know, this is certainly true of groups who gather without permits and without weapons to oppose privatization and rally for democracy, as we saw in Geze Park and, and elsewhere. Although such groups are shorn of legal and police protection, they are not for that reason reduced to some sort of bare life. There's no sovereign power jettisoning the subject outside the domain of the political. There's a renewal of popular sovereignty outside of and against the terms of state sovereignty and police power, one that involves a concerted and corp corporeal form of exposure and resistance. Vulnerability can emerge within resistance and direct democracy movements precisely as a deliberate mobilization of bodily exposure. I suggested earlier we had to deal with two senses of resistance here, a resistance to vulnerability that belongs to certain projects of thought and practice, um, organized by sovereign masters, mastery, and a resistance to unjust and violent regimes that mobilize vulnerability as part of its own exercise of power. In political life, it surely seems that some injustice happens and then there's a response, and it may be that the response is happening as the injustice occurs, and this gives us another way to think about historical events, action, passion, vulnerability, and forms of resistance. It would seem that without being able to think about vulnerability, we cannot think about resistance, and that by thinking about resistance, we are already underway dismantling the resistance to vulnerability in order politically to resist. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Martin, you take it from here. and spoke about the vulnerability mm -hmm. of um, a dawn of an arms race mm -hmm. in Iran. And I wanted to perhaps hear your reflections in light of vulnerability and resistance to what he incited in that offering to Congress. Okay. I was being so careful not to really go down that road. <laughs> okay, you're inviting me. I'm going to take up your invitation. One of the things that interests me um, about vulnerability, this may seem like a detour, but it's not. I promise you I'll be direct. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, one of the things that interests me about vulnerability, and one reason I want to say we shouldn't just think of it as a subjective disposition, like characterizing this person or that person, although we do do that in ordinary language, and it makes sense to us to do that is that um, uh, it keeps us from understanding that um, uh, vulnerability by definition is reciprocal. In other words, um, uh, I may understand myself as the vulnerable one in a relationship, but the person I fear is also obviously vulnerable in some other way, even though I might not be able to see it. And I may be, in fact, blocked from seeing it because my preoccupation with my own vulnerability is so heightened. I think we, we know this from personal relationships and other catastrophic forms of intimacy. <laughs> um, so one of the questions is how do we get a view on vulnerability? The, the fear of being obliterated, right? The fear of being obliterated and um, the, the, the fear of being obliterated that can lead one to obliterate first or seek to do damage first. Right, there's an old uh, rabbinic tale, like if you know somebody's coming to kill you, you should get up very early in the morning and be ready. Get them first, right? Um, but I'm not willing to, to stay with that, right? even though it's, it's a very interesting um, Talmudic um, defense of self-defense. Um, but I think that trying to understand relationships of vulnerability and agency as characterizing a number of different positions in the social and political field is very, very hard to do, and it's especially hard to do when one is preoccupied with one's own vulnerability exclusively, right? Because at that point, self-defense uh, means that I will do whatever it takes to defend myself or those who are like me against any kind of perceived peril. Um, and then the question is, well, wait a second. You're willing to defend those who are yourself or those who are like you against any perceived peril because why? Because national belonging, religious belonging, um, political belonging circumscribes the people you're willing to protect and whose lives you seek to defend. How difficult it is from within that position, and whether we're talking about Palestine, whether we're talking about Iran, whether we're talking about Israel, how difficult it is from within that position, these, this is me, this is my people, this is my sphere of belonging, to actually universalize the claim and say that all lives, regardless of their religious background, their racial background, actually deserve the same protection from violence. 
and we could quarrel. We could say, but that violence is greater than that violence, and we get into these comparative calculations, but there's something obscene about the calculation, right? Because the right to be protected from obliteration should be an absolute right. It's not one that is uh, calculable. We're also, we also have to be careful not to overstate or fabricate in order to defend ourselves or to only or to uh, use that as an alibi for other forms of military aggression. And that's a tricky one. And, and that's a highly debated one. So, I don't know, was Netanyahu vulnerable? Was he powerful? Did he defy the President of the United States? Sure seems like he did. Does he speak for all Israelis? I don't think so. The polls don't suggest that's the case. Does he speak for American Jews? The polls emphatically say that's not the case. Who, who, are, who are his people? Um, I don't like Iran. I'm afraid of Iran. I don't like Iran. I don't know if the present government is the exact same as all the other governments. If you make that claim, then you're saying, oh, these people are all the same regardless of how they vote or how their governments change because there's something about Iranians that is just this way and they, right? I'm, I just, I think we need to be more historically and politically specific, right? Um, but I would say ethically speaking, the problem of self-defense, which is inevitable, <laughs> So it always has to figure out where does my self begin and end? And is it just that I defend my individual self or those who are like me, those who are part of my own religion? Makes sense. You know, most of the pacifists I know say, uh, I'm a pacifist, but if anybody attacked my kid, I'd kill them. <laughs> right? And that makes, and we know that. But then it, and then it can get a little bigger. Like, I'm a pacifist, but if anybody attack my kid or my family members, I would kill them. Well, what about your second cousin? I don't know if I would do it for my second cousin. <laughs> right, and then we just start making these distinctions, right? These are the people we fight for, whose lives are worthy, who, who we care about, and we're willing to do politically whatever is necessary to defend. But yeah, yeah, that other, I can't go that far. Right, and then we're not really thinking through whether our principles are egalitarian, whether our principles are universalizable. And I don't think it's possible to come up with a steady static universal, but I think we have to test ourselves with that, with that question of universality. So it is still an indirect answer, but I, I hope I've made some of my positions clear. Thank you. Hi. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's easy and not so easy. I want to say two things about it. I myself um, do have a principled position of nonviolence, even though I know that makes me politically really naive. But I feel like, like, like some it's really important that there are still people in the world who hold to that position because it would be a more impoverished world if no one held to that position. So I'm just gonna be this naive creature. Interestingly, I get accused of you know, being allied with violent groups, which I've never been. Uh, and so one has to wonder a little bit about how that can possibly happen. First I thought it was a joke, then I realized they were serious. Um, but look, this is what I wanna say. Um, uh, I'm opposed to self-immolation. That 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 undermines the. How to account for it? Yes. Well, look. I do think that some people would argue that if you're already living a life that is not livable, if you are already considered to be a non-life, if the life you are living is effectively social death then self-immolation is simply a way of exposing and letting it be known that this life is not livable, right? Um, 
I understand that as a kind of statement. I can read it interpretively. Um, um, I think it's a second question when self-immolation also takes the lives of others, that is to say, suicide murders. And that, I think, is a much more complex uh, taking down of all life. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think about the Tibetan monks, I think about other examples of self-immolation. Um, I think in some of those examples, uh, life itself is not sacred. Uh, it is only the livable life, or it's only a certain life in freedom, or it's a, it's, a, it's a life without censorship, or it's a life without threat that's livable. So it's a way of making that distinction and insisting on that distinction. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about it. Anybody else want to talk to me? <laughs> Amanda. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the kind of always already um, mm -hmm. prescription of normativity. And then also how you talked about um, the role of understanding, mm -hmm. the understanding in terms of constructing or performing an operation that might actually dislodge those norms. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that pivotal moment, uh, because the, the kind of terms like consciousness, the role of consciousness, um, knowledge, reason even, like, and, and even what articulates that moment of understanding or how do we address the understanding, um, which al although we, we can say norms all the way down, mm -hmm. actually in the moment of consciousness we begin to have a cognizant uh, moment which possibly particularizes Uh huh. Yes. I mean, you could just say something about courage. Yes. Well, let me put it this way. Um, in in my understanding, and this, you know, I this may be kind of limited and 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 perhaps uh, odd, but I mean, I don't think we can reverse our formations exactly. I mean, I think there is a certain kind of hope that once we arrive at understanding or reason, and we start to think critically about how we have been formed, we can we can um, extricate ourselves from that formation and now become critical beings who are at a distance from whatever that less than critical formation might be. But I think that that's not quite the way it works. I feel like even childhood, you know, we talk about, well, that was my childhood and I was affected by that then. But childhood keeps affecting us throughout adult life. And I suppose I'm psychoanalytic enough to think that that's true that it's not as if something happened way back when. Those things continue to happen. Uh, they, they continue to affect. There, there, there are many kinds of ways in which we're affected, not, not just by childhood, but by really early uh, 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 cultural values or normative understandings of the world. And, and we don't exactly liberate ourselves from our formations, but it is possible to live within a formation and to become critical of it and to live that as a kind of tension or even as a kind of sometimes being torn apart, sometimes being mildly paradoxical. <laughs> um, but I think they coexist temporally. In other words, I don't think we can rely on the sequential um, uh, dawn of enlightenment to totally... Um, liberate us from what is unconscious and unwilled about how we are formed and continue to be formed. I mean, after all, we're still living in language, we're living in power, we're living in all kinds of um, social relations that affect us at that level that we don't fully will. And that continues to happen to us. It's not just the model of infancy. It continues to happen to us, and we, we never get kind of full critical mastery over that. We can we can be, as it were, 
formed by, and affected by what we do not control, but also develop forms of criticism that are not the same as mastery, right? And not the same as the denial of a formation, which doesn't mean you live out your formation uncritically, but that you live it with a certain kind of tension, maybe humility and tension. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, well, I think when, when Ruthie Gilmore points out that black people in the United States um, suffer early mortality rates at disproportionate levels, she's actually identifying them as, as a precarious population. That is to say, the chances are higher that life will be foreshortened. The chances are higher that... Um, certain kinds of injuries will not be redressed. The chances are higher that you'll get arrested. The chances are higher that you'll be imprisoned and even have to stay there. So I think that those, those um, demographic realities are very much part of precarity. I, I did try to write something on the Black Lives Matter movement, which you can probably find online, in which I also suggest that um, in many of these cases, especially in Ferguson, um, but also Trayvon Martin, what we see is, is the, the idea, I think, that, um, uh, uh, that certain lives are considered to be disposable or certain lives are considered to be a, a, a threat, um, are very often perceived as a threat to police authority or to police power and nullified as a result of that perception. If that would be a case where I, I wonder... Um, whether those lives are actually considered to be grievable, um, that is to say, worthy of protection, worthy of support, um, 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 ent entitled to a, 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 a life with endurance and the capacity for flourishing. And um, when, when lives are taken with such swiftness and without proper, um, without, without, uh, I mean, black men without guns, right, who are already down or already being strangled. <laughs> uh, why, why, that, why that next step of snuffing out the life? It's because in some sense it's not a life or it's not a, it's not a, it's not a grievable life, it's not a valuable life, it's not a life that's understood as one worth living. There are other lives we, I would say, you know, that are more generally uh, uh, treated as if they're hyper-grievable, they're hyper-valuable. The loss of those lives would be a devastating loss. But here again, there's a question of where, where do our ideas of equality begin and end? What would it mean to think about a radical egalitarianism of the grievable? What would it mean to organize society such that all lives were equally grievable? I think there's, a, there's an unequal distribution of grievability. And, and one axis of that unequal distribution, very large axis, is race. Uh huh. Are you are you perhaps suggesting that um, that the right to employment is generally not recognized as a right, like it's either good luck or bad luck, but it's not an, it's not a right exactly? Yeah. 
Well, maybe um, what you're really asking is for the meaning and um, place of labor to be um, thought more broadly in terms of what we mean by a livable life, because work, as you know, can be numbing of the senses and uh, undermining of um, livability, depending on what the conditions of work are, but also um, unemployment or joblessness, especially chronic joblessness, um, can also decimate you from another direction. Um, so I think your question probably is a broader one about how we think about conditions of work, not just as individual rights, but as um, um, as part of the, the 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 social and economic organization of of, of livable life. Um, I think we probably have to go back through Marx to do that, um, including the early Marx, um, who interestingly enough not only gives us the value of work and the labor theory of value. I know it's contested; it doesn't matter for the moment, but um, but also suggests that that work is only part of life and should not be the defining character of life. And I think people sometimes get that wrong about him. They think, oh, he just thinks we're laboring beings. It's like, well, actually not. He had an idea of a life in which work makes sense and, and work is part of human flourishing and the development of the senses. And then he understood that there are conditions under which the senses are decimated and where work overpowers and life itself is not livable under such conditions. So I think we need, a, a, we need to start to build a broader picture around that kind of issue um, to answer your question well. Okay, if there are. Okay. Yes. Please. Mm. You, you are in a vulnerable position, you use maybe the word vulnerable, but you are in a position that they, I would say, vulnerable, because the mm. words come out of your body and go out, but don't necessarily reach the other, and don't necessarily get processed outside of the cliché of working. So I was thinking of the connection between those that earlier text and then today possibility. Then it came to my mind the, the chances are that you go to a Yugoslavia talk and the, there are a lot more white people who have to work. Hmm. And I found that, of course, one of the contradictions of, of what we do and what we say. Uh, it, not what we do, but of, of, of the conditions in which it decides our activity. And the last thing that came to my mind is recently I've been looking at papers of Harold Gamers, they're here in um, Los Angeles, and I found a paper with, where he was putting in two columns, one on the left, one on the right, elements that would fit into a, a tradition about total art, Gesamtkunstler, uh, and he listed on the right things like um, the Nazi parade and uh, Epcot, and on the left he listed and push shifts. And the distinction between the two was that on the right, the fiction and the reality, the fiction and the real, were there was an attempt to identify. Whereas on the left, there was no attempt to identify the fiction and the real. There was a failure in the attempt to identify them. And therefore, the failure of the utopia to be enacted is not produced at this moment, like Monte Verita in Ascona is still here. So I think you, I, I th I've been thinking about this question of vulnerability in relation to the failure of one's proposition, which makes, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, to, that, that would put things like artistic practice, even when actual artistic practice, in the space of the proposition that remains in the space of the proposition by being vulnerable somehow. Whereas if it speaks in a space where the symbolic and the real are collapsed on each other, somehow it becomes rigid. And okay. Success
I see. Oh, you, you give me many interesting avenues. Um, and I, I appreciate your, um, your suggestions. I'm trying to remember the I Love You. I think it was something I published in um, the Women's Studies Journal. And, um, and, uh, and I think that that was um, uh, an effort to think uh, not just about how to get beyond the cliche uh, dimension of the proposition I Love You, but to actually rely on its repeatability. In other words, if I say to someone that I love you, that means that um, I will love you, or that I'm, it's not just a punctual <laughs> utterance. Like, I love you for the instance in which I enunciate this <laughs> statement, but as soon as I'm finished speaking, it's gone, right? <laughs> I mean, in, in other words, I love you has a kind of, um, it's, it's got to be repeatable, so we rely on its repeatability. In other words, I love you and I will repeat that I love you. I love you, which means I'm committed to a certain kind of repetition of that claim. And every time I make it, it will be a renewal of the claim. It won't just be a mechanical repetition, but it will be a renewal in time of the claim. And I, so I was trying, I think, there to suggest that there are ways of thinking about even the cliche as repetition, right, a repeated phrase, that can be animating and actually uh, quite important for the thinking about what love is or how it is we uh, address one another um, uh, in that way. I think I also wanted to be to be thinking about the mode of address as implicating us in an intersubjective world, which is what I was trying to say um, about um, about vulnerability not just being a subjective disposition, but a, a relationship to a world of others and to passions and forces. Um, I think that um, I don't usually work within the idea of the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real, but I, I think that perhaps what, what you're um, suggesting is that uh, um, it may be important for artistic practice to take place outside of the space of the propositional. Now, if I understand that correctly, I think I do agree, because I don't think that every embodied enactment, every performance, for instance, every artistic performance, can be uh, translated readily into propositional form. And so that's a limit of theory. That's a limit of everything I have said, <laughs> right? Except maybe that in speaking or in saying, I'm doing something other than delivering propositional forms, because I'm embodied and I flew here and I, you know, I ate my dinner so I could stand up straight and talk to you. Um, um, in other words, there's a that very often what the body does and what the body says are not always in perfect conformity with one another. And I think there are enactments, bodily enactments, and one of the things I'm trying to get to in the work on assembly and, and demonstrations is to think about the articulate feature of bodily enactments, of gathering itself, of showing up, that, that are not reducible to any propositional form, not even the ones that I use to describe it. And that has to do, I think, with uh, ways in which the, the bodily, bodily uh, and collective bodily mm, um, forms of mobilization or demonstration or concerted action of various kinds um, uh, have, have performative effects, have, have very consequential effects without necessarily taking um, the form of speech or taking the form of the proposition. So if that's a utopian idea, that we might produce a certain kind of critical distance from the propositional form, that's good. But that means that every critic must be self-limiting. And on that note, I'm going to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.